Vladigan. Here. Member O'Neill. Here. Council Member O'Neill. Here. Council Member Dovin. Here. Council Member Glaufenstein. Here. Council Member Kim Wimpinaloza. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Tran. Here. And Mayor Jones. Here. Um, who's doing the invocation tonight? Matt, okay. May I ask Matt West to do the invocation um, followed by Council Member Klopfenstein to do the pledge? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> please prepare yourself according to your faith. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve the people of Garden Grove. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service and guide us to be the leaders the community need. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Please place your hand over your heart and repeat after me. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and we will now uh, recess over to the Housing Authority. So I'll hand it over to Chair Kim Wynn Penalosa. Uh, roll, please. Commissioner Dovin. Commissioner Jones. Here. Commissioner Klumpenstein. Here. Commissioner O'Neill. Here. Commissioner Tran. Here. Vice Chair Bridegum. Here. And Chair Kim Wynn Penalosa. Here. Moving on to, or is there anyone here to speak for the Housing Authority? Seeing none, I'll move on to consent. I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I'll move it. Second. Second. Thank you. Please call for the vote. Motion received, seven yes votes. Okay, moving on to item three. Any matters from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll adjourn the, the meeting, and the next meeting will be on Tuesday, March 26th at 5.30 p.m. Switching it back to the mayor. Thank you. We'll reconvene city council. That um, takes us on to presentations, and we do have one item listed, um, item 1A, which is information on the 49th Annual Americana Awards. It's presented by Howard Kummerman, Executive Director of Cypress College Foundation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. It's great to be here again amongst you. You must be doing something really right. You don't have very many people here tonight. <laughs> it's very quiet. It's very good. We were in Anaheim an hour ago, really so it's, uh, yeah. this is really quiet. So I really uh, I want to, I think we have a short presentation. I saw it starting to go up on the, oh, you want to hand me that? There we go. Well, I want to thank you for having us here today to talk about our 49th Annual Americana Awards coming up on March 16th. We are going to be at the Westin Anaheim Resort this year. It's a change for us. Make sure you don't show up at Disney. We are at Westin. Well, first off, uh, I just want to uh, recognize that we've had 53 citizens of the year from the, the city of Garden Grove and it's been our pleasure to recognize them. We have an incredible city committee led by Susan Lerma who has been tireless in finding us fabulous honorees like the one that we're going to be recognizing here tonight. As you see, we have more than a thousand students from the city of Garden Grove that are attending Cypress College right now this semester. And the funds that we raise from the Americana Awards help us to provide for scholarships, emergency assistance, and other programs at the college. Our enrollment is up almost to pre-pandemic levels now. Uh, most of our classes are back in person again, and our students need the funds more than ever. And so your support as we move forward is, is very important for this event. We have a brand new president at Cypress College, Dr. Scott Thayer. He started two months ago, and uh, he's got open arms out to the community. He looks forward to working with the council and Garden Grove and welcoming your students and making sure that we're partnering with uh, with industry and meeting the needs of the community. So last year, we recognized David and Janice Skelton, and this year we look forward to recognizing Joe Hammer at the Americana Awards. Is there anything Joe hasn't been recognized before? before? No, <laughs> I'm going to say a couple things about Joe. 
Joe Hammer's life is marked by his active involvement in the Garden Grove Rotary Club, passion for bass fishing and woodworking, and a sharp mind enjoying Sudoku and crosswords daily. Mm. That must be the secret. A veteran entrepreneur and community leader, Joe's ethos is tackling challenges head on, underscored by a 70-year partnership with his wife, Marie, that's navigated business success and community service. Their shared belief in doing the right thing has led to a life of adventure, contribution, and enduring love. And uh, to hear more about Joe, you have to come to the Americana Awards on March 16th. Here's a short video with Joe. Hello, my name is Joe Hammer. I'm the Citizen of the Year for the city of Garden Grove, California. Please join me on March 16th, 2024, for the Americana Awards at the Westin Anaheim Resort. Who could say no to that, right? <laughs> We've got another incredible video, which you will see when you come to the Americana Awards. We have a fabulous opportunity drawing every single year. It's another way that we help to raise money for our students. So we hope that you'll join us on March 16th. We have an incredible silent auction. I think most of you have all been to the event again. We invite you to sponsor the event, to attend it. And of course, you always give us great auction items to help us as well. I'd like to invite Joe up, maybe just to say a couple of words to you as we recognize him. Joe Hammer. This is getting to be a habit. <laughs> we gotta stop this. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate the, the fact that uh, I've been named this year for as Citizen of the Year, and I'm looking forward to the Americana Awards. I hope I see some of you there, or many of you anyway, and uh, it's an honor for me. I appreciate it very much. That's about all I can tell you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so too. much. I don't know how if it's uh, if it's okay with you, Mr. Mayor. Can we have a quick picture with the the council and, oh, and, and Joe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to come? Yeah, come up here. Joe, would you come up for a picture? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is your day. Yeah. <laughs> here, why don't you come right over here? You guys, Everybody. you guys are welcome to clear on out unless you want to Sorry, stay around and watch us fill potholes. <laughs> Alrighty, next is oral communications. We'll open oral communications. I have one card from Aaron Leal. Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me good? Yep. Great. So the timer starts now. <laughs> so, hello, Mr. Mayor. Hello, honorable council members. My name's Aaron Leal. I'm a representative from Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'm just here to give a quick presentation to you guys. So um, dementia is a public health crisis. We need your support to combat this terrible disease which robs patients of its memory as well as um, its and minds. And this disease also devastates families financially as well as emotionally. Um, for example, more than 164,000 people in Orange County has either Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment and it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States or, and also the third leading cause of death here in Orange County. Alzheimer's Orange County is your local community-based organization that has been providing for OC families since 1982 
every dollar raised here in Orange County stays here in Orange County and to provide locally responsive programs and a comprehensive array of free services. For example, our information and referral to community resources, our support for caregivers from licensed clinical staff, as well as telephone helplines staffed by clinical social workers who are dementia care specialists, as well as providing services for families and professional caregivers alike. We operate two adult day healthcare centers, um, Healthy Aging Center Acacia here in Garden Grove, as well as Healthy Aging Center in Laguna Woods. Uh, we so appreciate the collaboration and support the City of Garden Grove has provided Alzheimer's Orange County and our Acacia Healthy Aging Center over the years. Um, with this, we hope that you will attend our upcoming Walk for Alzheimer's on Saturday, March 23rd at Angel Stadium of Anaheim. And the mayor, the city council, and the residents of Garden Grove are encouraged to join us and participate in this hopeful, inspiring day. Alzheimer's and related forms of dementia are not normal parts of aging, and we have to do all that we can to end dementia, or it will be the defining disease of the baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't mean to copy the person before me, yeah. but can I take a photo of <laughs> the council? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. With my phone, at least. <laughs> Giving the mayor a run for the money on time. Oh, there you go. Look at you go. See? The mayor do that for you. Okay, here we go. I'll forward a message. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you. See you. See you. See you. Bye bye. <laughs> All right, we will now recess um, to successor agency. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Member Breidigam? Here. Member Tran? Here. Member Dovin? Present. Member Klopfenstein? Here. Member Wimpinolosa? Here. Vice Chair O'Neill. Here. And Chair Jones. Here. All right. We already did oral communications, so we'll close that. Um, consent items just received and filed. Can I get a motion? Second. Call the vote. Okay. Motion received. Seven yes votes. Any matters? Seeing none, we will adjourn to Sanitary District. I'll hand Thank it over to President O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, we'll open up the Garden Grove Sanitary District Board of Directors meeting. If you could, please, Clerk, could please call the roll. Okay. Let me get you over there. Member Breidigam? Here. Member Dovin? Present. Member Klompenstein? Here. Member Wimpy Nolosa? Here. Member Jones? Here. Vice President Tran? Here. And President O'Neill? Here. Thank you. Uh, we've already held oral communication simultaneously with council. All we have tonight is the consent items, which is receive and file the minutes from the last meeting. Move it. I have a motion. And second. A second. Please call for the vote. Okay. Motion received. Seven yes votes. Thank you. Any matters from board members? Uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn until the next uh, regular meeting of the Sanitary District, March 26th, 630 in this room. Thank you. All right, we will reconvene. City Council takes us on to consent calendar. It's recommended that 3A through 3G be acted on simultaneously, unless anyone would like to pull an item. I'll move it. I'll second. Call to vote. Motion received, seven yes votes. Items for consideration, 4A. Item 4A is approval of a cooperative agreement for a Euclid Street Corridor Traffic Signal Synchronization Project, CP1325000. And Mr. Murray should be here soon to give that report.
Thank you, Ms. Promerway. Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Tonight, city council is being asked to approve a cooperative agreement with the cities of La Habra, Fullerton, Anaheim, Santa Ana, and Fountain Valley for the Euclid Street traffic signalization project. This project is part of OCTA's regional traffic signal, signal synchronization program. And this program uh, will fund about 80% of the project. Well, 80%. The City of La Habra will be the lead agency and they will be responsible for the contract administration, uh, overseeing the synchronization study and the construction documents. In general, the project will provide for the development and implementation of a signal timing plan, uh, traffic signal uh, equipment upgrades, and two years of traffic signal timing maintenance. All of this work is expected to be completed by the end of 2026. The cooperative agreement will provide for payment of the traffic signal work located in the city of Garden Grove and our fair share of the synchronization study. Garden Grove's share of the work is just over $1.4 million. The city will need to provide matching funds for about 20% of the cost, which is just over $286,000. The funds will come from the city's red light camera fund, which is included in this, this year's city's budgets. Staff is recommending approval of the cooperative agreement and to authorize the city manager to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. This concludes staff's report and I'm available should you have any questions. Thank you, Bill. Any questions or a motion? I have motion? a comment and a motion. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I think this is well overdue. I mean, when people are coming eastbound <laughs> on the 22 freeway, especially rush hour-ish, and you get off there at Euclid, it can take 20 minutes just to get around to go to Trask. Um, sometimes it's backed up, the freeway's backed up a quarter of a mile, so you're coming to a pretty rapid stop. So I'm thankful that they're looking into this. Hopefully this will address that issue. But uh, what is the average speed? I think it's 40 miles an hour that they sync them to, is that, or is it? It'll be, they'll start with a whole traffic study on, on this thing, and they may in fact Speed through there, but it, it all has to be done for the traffic. Okay, well, I'll make the motion. I'll second. Hold the vote. Motion, re <coughs> motion received seven yes votes. Ordinances presented for second reading and adoption 5A. Item 5A is second reading and adoption of ordinance number 2952 entitled an ordinance of the city council, the city of Garden Grove approving zoning amendment number A36 2023 to amend the city's official zoning map to change the zoning designation of properties located at 13252 Brooker Street and 10052 Central Avenue and identified as assessors parcel numbers 09903101, 09903102, 09903108 and 09903109 from C1 neighborhood commercial and R2 limited multiple residential to R3 multiple family residential. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll make a comment and then um, I'll move it if um, we can have that. Uh, this is in my district and I, I spoke to it uh, a little bit more than um, usual because it's a, a property that has some blight in the past and uh, we were very happy with the uh, developers who came in and gave presentation and we all got a chance to ask our questions and give our comments uh, this is the second reading i fully support it and really look forward to uh, the development of this corner uh, which is a um, very uh, high density neighborhood uh, with these multiple residential development i think it it fits right in to um, the overall makeup of the neighborhood and I'd, I'd really encourage more development of this kind and hopefully um, uh, my fellow council member and mayor can support other developments in their district so i'm going to vote it up and uh, I'm very appreciative of the uh, owners and developers coming in with this project was that a motion Joe? yes I'll, I'll second it 
I, I didn't know. Oh, I, think, I think you thought I did. All right, we have a motion and a second. Call the vote. Motion received, seven yes votes. Moving right along. Uh, matters, we do have one listed, 6A. It's an update on the Civic Center Revitalization Project. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, um, exec Executive Director and Project Manager, Craig Beck will lead with some opening remarks and then we'll turn it over to the development team um, from Edgemore. Good evening, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. We're pleased to be before you this evening to provide a project update on the Civic Center Revitalization Project. And with me tonight, I have um, Brian Dugan and Christine Solomon, who's been working with us on Edgemore on this project. They're gonna go through a couple updates on the technical aspect, and then I'll go through where we're at with the financing and community participation. With that, Brian. Thanks, Craig. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I'm happy to be here again, see you all. Uh, we just have a, a quick project update, like Craig said. This evening, we're gonna talk through just project status, where are we, where are we at in the process. Um, Christine, uh, we'll talk to you, Christina. We have a Christine I work with a lot, too. She'll talk to you through you know, where we're at with design, give a little update on that element. We'll talk through community engagement and the entitlement process, and then close with an update on project financing. So you all have seen this slide several times now, but we are at the phase where we're in the process of finalizing the design, finalizing the project agreement negotiations, uh, the community engagement. We've already received a, a lot of engagement and feedback from the community, incorporating all of that into the design, and then we'll move post this, what we're in right now is the exclusive negotiating phase. Uh, after March 2024, we'll then move into the next phase for the project, and we're targeting a financial close um, in the summertime. We, here's a timeline here that you can kind of see we're in this ENA period phase three. We gave you an update back in November. We were here to update you all again. And once we've got the project agreement ready to come back and seek approval, we'll come back at that point. Uh, date TBD, but hopefully we're moving closely to, uh, to get there. This is how the, the working group is organized with us and with the city and with the PD. So we've got working groups for these five major sort of work streams or elements of the project. Design and construction, entitlements, permitting and engagement, project financing, commercial legal, and building and commissioning. <coughs> These, all of these groups have been working really well together for the past several months to get us to where we are today. And really, I think we're feeling really good about finishing the ENA phase, uh, which is, is scheduled through the end of March, and we're planning to finish that on time. So Christina, we'll talk through design and construction. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, fellow council members, very excited to provide a brief design update for you all tonight. So I just wanted to start with a couple of things that we talked about in November, just to remind everyone of some of the principles that we've been targeting as part of this project. So we know that we were develop, delivering a police building, a parking structure, and a park. But from a design perspective, some of the key principles that we are using to ground our team are really around operational efficiency, maintainability, really understanding a campus style site so that this new building really fits in with the other buildings that are currently in this area. Um, like this one we're in right now. And then also making sure it's a statement building. We know where this building sits on the corner of Euclid and Acacia. It's going to be a really prominent building for the community, so making sure we understood that as part of the design. The hope is that if we're able to hit these key principles from a design perspective, then some of these other outcomes really transpire. Looking at connected community, increased productivity, retention and recruitment for the police department, as well as long-term affordability. So those have really been what's been driving us for, from a design perspective. 
Um, and as a reminder, back in November, we shared two different concepts. Um, and this is the concept that we've been proceeding with since then, looking at a building that is parallel to Euclid. And you can see a police memorial that is right, right off of Acacia in that, in that little yellow oval there. And then from a facade perspective, this is the concept that we've been proceeding with. Now, this is still a very conceptual design. So what we've been working on as a team is a couple different things. First, looking at better understanding what the materials could be to achieve this, this look. One of the things we talked about in November was really mixing materials. So we're looking at both curtain wall, concrete, metal panels, and how we can achieve a look. Now, that being said, this is still very, very um, conceptual, and the team has been working on a lot of exciting ex advancements. Um, so some of the things we've been looking at really refining the architectural statement. As I mentioned, that prominent location on Euclid and Acacia, making sure it feels like it is solid in that corner. So we've been working a lot on that. Some of the things we've been looking at is other unifying elements throughout the facade to tie in the lower, the lower connecting area with the taller building. Um, so these are all things that we've been working on quite a bit as a design team. As I mentioned, material selection. So this is all in progress right now. We've been getting different samples from vendors so we can start seeing how materials work together, um, all part of the design process. We've also been looking at the building height, so looking at parapets, floor-to-floor -floor heights, and, and any sort of architectural feature that might be on top of the building, again, to create that statement. Um, and then also the public entry design. Right now the public entry is on the, right off of Acacia and making sure it's visible and noticeable from the public so people know where they are arriving to. So, so these are some of the things that we've been advancing. The design is almost ready for prime time, not quite there yet, but looking forward to sharing some exciting updates on that as we develop it more. And I think just worth noting is a lot of the work that's been happening the last few months is on the inside. And it, I think you'll talk some more about that. Yeah, exactly. So really what we've been focusing on since November is the inside of the building and really focusing on how does this building operate? One of our key principles is operational efficiency. So we've been focusing on under, refining the program and the adjacencies. So as we know, a while ago, Dewberry did a preliminary programming analysis, and then that was then refined for and optimized for cost by PFAL and HOK. Now what we've been doing is really optimizing it for building operations. So we've been spending a lot of time with the police department and other folks with the city to work through what that looks like. So at a very high level, what we've been doing is leveraging different tools so we can figure out the best way to lay out the functions within the building. So on the left-hand side, this is a pretty rudimentary tool that we use, but it's really effective at getting feedback from PD to understand at a high level what, what groups want to live where in the building, especially talking about the first floor. The first floor is really high value real estate. So there was a lot of conversation about what lives on that ground floor. And we use that, that version on the left to really talk about block diagrams, where things go. And then as we've been advancing the design to what you see on the right, starting to even look more at the individual departments and how it lays out, how, does, how do the groups work within their own space. Um, so in order to do that, as I mentioned, we have these tools. We've also been meeting weekly with the police department to make sure we get their feedback. And then a couple weeks, we actually did a full two-day summit with the, the broader department to make sure we got even more feedback. So we're feeling really good about how this building operates. Um, really, I mean, every, every step of the way, we sort of found really good, efficient op ways for this building to work. Um, and so we're really excited about how this building is coming together. And then just, again, talking about the first floor, wanted to highlight some of the public access areas. So key, the key public access is off of Acacia. So we have these four areas highlighted. Number one, on the west, that's where the lobby will be. Again, trying to create that, that entry space so that people know where to go. Um, number two there, that's the EOC and community room. And the nice thing about the way this is situated right now is that it really marries nicely with the police memorial, which is in that little courtyard. Um, where number three is, and then number four is the public parking. So you can see that all the public, public uses are really consolidated. It should be a really easy experience for, for public to get in and around the space. And then I'll talk a little bit about the park. So as we talked about last, 
in November, thinking about the concept of the park being like a, a flower that is budding. And so we haven't spent a ton of time putting a lot more design detail into the park itself because we want to make sure we're still able to get community feedback. But one of the th what we started doing is thinking about how does that concept now lay out into a site plan? How can we transform what we the idea into a site plan? So you can see some early work on that as well. And then just from a PLA perspective, so this project will have a, a project labor agreement. Um, so this is currently being drafted. It should be done actually today or tomorrow if it's not done already. Um, and so we have engaged the trades on this project. They are aware of it. And we'll have make sure we have local hiring provisions to make sure we're prioritizing Garden Grove labor. We are also next week having a small business event to make sure we bring some more attention to the project and seeing where we can provide more opportunities for small businesses to be involved. And with that, I will pass it over to Craig to talk through entitlements permitting. Oh, yes. Should, should we ask any questions now or wait till later? Oh, you can ask them now. That's fine. I just have a couple questions. Um, uh, if you go back to the first few slides, uh, yeah. uh, I like the uh, open frontage looks of it, feels of it, looks very pleasant and accessible, friendly, and uh, uh, public friendly. We want a lot of public Great. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned because in these demonstrations, I don't see uh, bowlers or barriers. Uh, you probably just don't put them in because, of that, but because it's on both streets that I'm thinking to prevent any sort of a, a vehicle Yes, absolutely. And that's been one of the, several of the conversations we've had with PD also is how to protect that front lobby. So there's a lot of SEPTED principles that we'll bring in as we start to refine the landscaping design, where we put in bollards, more concrete, concrete barriers. But absolutely, it's very important for us to make sure that that lobby is protected. Sure, we can, we can definitely, we have been developing the site plan, so we can definitely share some of that next time. Um, lining up subcontractors so we are going into that next phase and I just want to kind of heads up on um, there you go so we'll wait for Craig thank you <laughs> of course thank you for the feedback okay so real quickly on CEQA and community participation I think I can address your question that you just brought up um, just as a reminder we did uh, prepare an environmental document that was approved by the Planning Commission in November so that aspect of the project is complete at that time the Planning Commission also approved a conditional use permit so the entitlement package for this particular project is done um, Part of the CEQA document identified the need to hire a biologist to look at the pond and the wildlife in the pond and how to treat the wildlife. Uh, the biologist, the, the firm name is Dudak, so they have been hired. Um, and then they also did develop a wildlife management plan. So we have a plan in place and ready to move forward with the pond. So at a point in time when we have project approval, we have addressed some of those environmental aspects of the project. Um, we've done a lot of community engagement up to this point and we continue. Uh, I think in the last briefing we talked about all the summer events where we had community members uh, engage with staff at, at different pop-ups, uh, different um, music and, and movies in the parks and, and those kind of things. Uh, then in December, after the last uh, update we provided to you, there was the tree lighting ceremony, had a lot of participation there, and then we also had an open house which was the first time that the community had an opportunity to engage directly with the development team. So we had the development team at that community open house event. So we do have some more events. We're gonna start uh, doing um, some additional events in March and in April. So the next one coming up is our small business outreach event. 
and I think Councilmember Devin, this may address part of your question, which is how are we engaging the local community and local businesses to participate in this project? So there are a couple things. One of the elements of the project labor agreement will prioritize local garden grove hires as part of the construction of the project. But there are also ancillary small business elements that can be involved in this project. And we're gonna engage on March 5th at 2.30 here at the CMC with, uh, with the community to talk about those opportunities. Uh, there will be another event at the Clementine Trolley uh, plan for March 7th and then art in the park on the 9th. So those are kind of what's coming up here in the next 30 days or so. And then I wanted to touch briefly on our financing plan for the project. If you recall, uh, early in the project review, we were looking at different aspects or uh, vehicles to finance this project. It was determined that the best path forward for financing was the lease revenue bonds structure. And so you can kind of see some of the aspects of the lease revenue bonds. Uh, we did bring forth a resolution in November for council to review and did receive approval to move forward with an intent to finance via lease revenue bonds. Uh, Patricia and her team are working on that and we should have a package before you uh, for approval in April. Overall, the project ceiling, if you will, the affordability limit for this project is $152 million. That includes $140 million in bonds that is part of that uh, resolution, and then $12 million in cash uh, that the city has set aside for a lot of these pre-development costs that, that we're talking about. As we went through the initial budgeting review from those conceptual designs that were shared, it was determined that we were at the very upper limit of the affordability cap on this project. So we went through a value engineering exercise as a team and we pulled roughly $10 million worth of costs out of the project to make sure that we were down within our affordability level because we still want to make sure that we have the ability to address some items as we move the design forward. And as Christina mentioned, I really appreciate all the work that's been done to make sure that operationally this building will function. Um, so kudos to um, uh, the police team for their participation. Um, but now we want to finish the outside and make sure we kind of hit that design intent and have an iconic building. So the next real design focus will be on the exterior of the building. So we're, we are looking at what are some of the impacts to the cost of this project and we are still surprised to see that the cost of construction wage wage growth continues even kind of if you consider where we are in this post -pand pandemic kind of catch-up era i guess uh, but construction wages are still growing faster than than um, regular wages and just in the past 12 months 4.3 percent increase in construction wages um, we're still seeing impacts on the cost of materials for the project. Those are other cost drivers that the team's very aware of, and we're, we're looking at how best to structure the gross maximum price on this project. So again, just in the past six months, 3% growth in those commodity costs, and, and prices still remain high for those disrupted materials. So things that have very long lead items, for example, uh, electric switch gear, those right now are looking at a year. We have a 50 to 70 week order time frame on switch gear. So those are elements that are potentially going to impact the scheduling of the project. We're keeping a close eye on that. Um, and then we are seeing some materials starting to kind of peak and, and I don't wanna say normalize because they're still up from traditionally where we've seen some material costing, but things do seem to maybe be turning that corner a little bit. So as far as, far as when we price this and, and uh, look to finance the project uh, in June, I think timing wise, we should be in a good place. So next steps, I, I kind of briefly mentioned that the, the team is working on the facade of the project. So the next iteration you see in the design will not only address the exterior look, but some of the, the streetscape experience that council member brought up. So how are we, we creating both an open and inviting and engaging building so the police department can engage with the Garden Grove community, but also a safe work environment as well. So we'll have that before you. We're hopeful that we can bring a package for council review 
um, either in late March or early April, and then the financing would follow uh, shortly after. And that concludes my presentation, and we're available for comments and questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I don't have questions, but I do have some comments. I recall mentioning an arborist being brought in. Yes. I don't know if Craig remembers, but that's for uh, uh, the planting out of the, mm -hmm. the part of the landscape. And I know we have biologists, and, and I'm, I'm very comfortable that we're going to have a very nice park with the pond. And I was also big on footbridges, <laughs> ridges to somewhere, and public art, because I think we have to anticipate there will be installations that doesn't happen with the same time we're building the campus, but eventually we will want some nice public art for people to enjoy in their public spaces. So um, the reason why I'm talking about the planting is we have that parking lot, and we have a parking lot issue when the trees, like pine trees, they grow too big, five, 10 years, the roots will bust up the concrete, and then we're looking at spending a million dollar in fixing that. So in anticipation of anything like that, maybe the planting can have an arborist study that because we do get a lot of sunlight in the afternoon when the sun is setting on the Euclid side, and there's gonna be a lot of heat. You got this open glass concept. You, you, you need something to shield against the setting sun. And that may big, be big trees, but those trees have to be you know, mindful of how they grow over the years. And five, ten years down the road, we're going to be stuck with a bill to fix our pavement. So try to anticipate some of that. And I've already mentioned about anticipating um, uh, uh, future potentials for the uses of those spaces. But, um, the labor cost, there's not too much we can do about that. We, we already know that. I mean, if it's rising construction costs, that's, that's very hard to factor into, uh, into m too much in advance. Um, but the material costs, especially the disrupted materials, I would suggest to uh, stay with materials that uh, will not be disrupted as much because we know what happened when supply chains break down. I'm a contractor, I'm a builder. I know when you're waiting on electrical supplies, it's crazy <laughs> and, and, and it can delay a significant amount of time. So I have only one suggestions on that part is that I haven't used the AI software myself, but I've heard there's some very good AI construction management software. They can work out the supply chain and uh, labor and the uh, the timeline and everything. It's not that expensive, so uh, if Craig might want to look into that, if there's a I software will. that uh, may help you kind of plan better, I think it's work. I've seen, uh, I've seen it uh, save a lot of money for and some and major projects. And actually, the, uh, our design builder, Clark Construction, you know, they've been dealing with the situation really since the outset of the, the pandemic, and so they've got an entire internal group that thinks through this track supply chains down to the materials going to the factories in the different countries where we're bringing certain parts. Yeah. So they're yeah. thinking as, you know, as much as we can, and they have a dedicated group internally that's thinking about just that issue is, yeah. you know, should we think about this or do we need to think about an alternative material here? Can we get this in time? Right. I mean, the big one is what Craig said that's still really killing uh, construction schedules is electrical switch gear. Yeah, yeah, it's, that, it's that can really can delay your project significantly. So my only suggestion is if there is a software, AI, and so forth, that can help plan for that better, it might be a good investment. Because I've, I've heard, I've never used it, but I've seen, uh, I've heard of projects can save millions of dollars by, okay. by that kind of uh, planning and use of AI, I, which I'm not big on AI, but for that, <laughs> for, for that purpose, if we can save money, I think it might be something to look into. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, it's wonderful to see this timeline and how just robust this project is and how quickly things are moving and seeing these boxes get checked is very exciting. Uh, I really appreciate the continuing of just the community conversations and the outreach. It's so crucial. It's important for our residents to feel that they have a seat at the table and a true buy-in to this project, which is very historic for our downtown. 
this um, police station and, and the entire campus will really anchor, I think, our Civic Center and downtown area, so it's very exciting. Um, the community events, I'm sure they'll be posted on social media so that we can share and other stakeholders in the community can share as well. You mentioned the Clem Clementine Trolley. Is that the one at the OC Food Bank or will it be positioned someplace else for that? Do we know? Yes. I believe it's being positioned at uh, Boyna Clinton, but we can certainly yeah. verify and confirm and provide that information. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think it's just great to be able to have touch points all over the city, not just here, obviously, within, within the downtown, but to make sure all the residents all over the community feel that they've been able to have some feedback and, and just be able to hear more about the project. So thank you very much. We, we have heard some of that feedback, and so we've got you know, an outreach consultant on our team. We're making sure that we're going and meeting with these stakeholder groups, with members in the business community all around different areas to make sure that we are touching sort of everybody in the community the best we can. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation and the update from everyone. Appreciate it. Sounds like everything's moving along nicely as well as it can. I'm confident in the financing. I'm confident in the design group. Um, anxious to get the ENA done. and. And, and, and move forward the financing. I, it sounds to me like the, the thing that we need to concentrate on the most with this whole project is that when we do, the general contractor I'm very confident will be already looking at the lead times of all the materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we should really uh, stress to the subcontractors when they provide their bid, they need to include their, their lead times on their products and they need to be aware that if they are issued the contract, those things need to be ordered immediately because I'm involved in the electrical industry and that is the one it, it's killing the whole building right now is it's a year out on switch gear but do that goes for in on the switch gear what's that I wish I, <laughs> I, I boy I, I try to pull some uh, some strings with Edison and other people but it they don't pay them too much attention to me so <laughs> I don't know we need more people building switch gear but um, I think just make sure we hold the subcontractors accountable to the timeline like I don't want them to get awarded the contract they're sitting on it for three months, and then their time comes up, and they're like, oh, wait, we forgot to order that stuff we could have ordered six months ago. You know, that just kills a project. So keep an eye on the subcontractors. Yeah, I think that'll help us a lot. Thank you very much, everybody. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, that's a great point. And we're looking at what packages can we release early, even yeah, ahead of sure. financial close. Yeah, anything. That sounds so. like the biggest thing. I've been in construction my entire life, and and that is always the biggest hiccup. So everybody gets excited about the project. We do the bidding, we do all this stuff. And then, you know, if the general contractor or the project management, whoever's dealing with that, they have their own processes and, and things that they're focused on. They're not always focused on once the subcontractor gets it, they're kind of like, oh, that's up to them. Right. Problem is, I don't want to put a subcontractor out of business. I want to help him complete his project. So please, you know, order your materials day one of issuing the contract. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yeah, more so than a lot of other projects we were so overly focused on making sure these procurements go through because of these issues. You don't want to, we can't afford to lose any time. So as soon as it's responsible for us to order this equipment. We're yeah, we're, I sit on the fire authority for the city and uh, a fire truck that used to take it two years is now four years or longer and it's doubled in price. So the sooner you can order yeah. it, the better. Yeah. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I'm really excited looking at the renderings and you know, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, I, I know this has been a long time. Some decades and so it, it's it, it's kind of cool to see it come into fruition um, I do share some of the sentiments everyone has pretty much said um, one of the concerns I saw the uh, curtain wall on the top part and I do know from experience there are times throughout a station's uh, lifetime that uh, you're gonna have to send police officers up to the roof for one reason or another and so I think you know, should look at making sure there's a catwalk on that so officers can access it and be able to. But yeah, I'm really excited in the balusters that uh, Councilman Dovin talked about, that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think uh, I'm really excited and I'm hoping, uh, I can't wait till we can see the final uh, sketches and whatnot. Absolutely, and one of the benefits of working with the PD every every week is that all of these comments come up every week. So we've definitely been looking at roof access and how do we keep people safe on the roof. Right now, looking at parapet heights so that there's no secondary fall protection. It's just all all fall protected from the from the get go. So definitely things that we are making sure this building is safe and operable. It's usually, the youngest police officer gets sent up there. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, just. Keeping that in mind, a catwalk for safety and that kind of stuff, and they yeah. got to have access to be able to look down and you know all that kind of stuff. But Absolutely, thank you for the comment. 
All righty, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, matters from council members, George. Um, not a whole lot. You know, we had an exciting weekend with the parades and uh, the opening day ceremonies and uh, whatnot. Um, the one interest of note this week was Animalia grand opening in my district, uh, uh, the pet supplies. Um, it's basically name brand stuff without the name brand. So it's made the same ingredients, the same stuff, but it has different names and it's a lot cheaper. So if you have pets, check them out. You might be pleasantly surprised. Uh, get your food for a lot cheaper and it's pretty much the same stuff as all the other name brand stuff. So, um, but that's all I have. Thank you. I'll just comment on the, uh, you know, the Little League started. So we had the parade on Saturday and, uh, and multiple Little Leagues starting. So be careful of the kids out there going to practice when you're driving uh, around. Be conscious of that if you're in a, a, near a school or a park. Um, remember to change your batteries on your smoke detectors. There's still a lot of fires everywhere. Um, um, you know, Magnolia Park's doing good. We're getting all the uh, playground equipment installed, the new stuff. So if you get a chance, go by there and check it out. There's still a little bit to do to clean up the park and stuff, but we're working on that. Um, other than that, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. The mayor, a um, couple of notes. So um, we just attend uh, Garden Go High School um, District, uh, Unified High School District, State of District last night. It was amazing. I am just so proud just to be, you know, part of the city, but also um, all the accomplishment that they they had done and the student um, won so many contests and so many I mean I I did I I participated in some of that and got to see the student did that but it's just amazing. I don't I do not know if any other um, high school or unified district will be able to beat all the accomplishment that they did. So that was just amazing thanks to um, uh, the staff, the school board and the teacher and also the student who actually participate and uh, make that um, become reality, make their dream come true in this city. Um, so that's first. And then the second thing, we um, the council member have the retreat um, uh, a week ago or so. And um, just uh, a quick note that we went to our priority and one of the priority was the infrastructure. And that is something that I know um, we have resident came up to the poll and talk about that and so just want to let the resident know that yes that's something that we put it a priority uh, last year and also this year too um, and then a couple of events at 10 um, I just want to say thank to Son for um, taking action um, there was some resident um, have some complaint about code violation and um, Son took the action um, just kind of pass the information to our staff, but also he follow um, to the end and provide some input. So I just want to um, um, take the opportunity to say thanks to Son for taking the action and get it done, um, follow all the way through. Um, I think that's it. Um, for my district, um, this Saturday coming up, the uh, UNI restaurant will have a one year anniversary um, and that's starting at 5 p.m. on Saturday. So everyone invited, free drink. That's it for me. <laughs> uh, I have some uh, events that I want to speak to, like um, like uh, Council Member uh, Mayor Pro Tem Cindy Tran just mentioned. We were there last night at the Gun Grove Unified School District, State of the District, and it was very impressive <coughs> how the e event was run. But it, it wasn't better than our Gun Grove City State of the <laughs> of the City which um, Mayor Steve Jones, <laughs> we had a very good time there with the magic of Garden Grove. So it remind me, we was in the same uh, uh, building, the Hyatt Regency there. And so uh, it's rarely that I get to attend an event with, with my wife, um, Dina Nguyen, who's a, a board trustee, and we were both there last night. And uh, it was amazing, the staff, the superintendent, uh, Gabriela Mafi. You, you see how she hosted the event very uh, gracefully and all the students we had hundreds of students uh, performed uh, all sorts of uh, um, art uh, music uh, it was it was, it was a, a, a wonderful treat for us to attend uh, so that was a uh, very memorable and uh, I do want to also speak a little bit about the retreat we just had <coughs> and I think it was <coughs> we did 
as much as we did last year in half the time. <clears throat> so we had a full day last year. We had half a day, but we went through the priorities and <clears throat> we pretty much re reaffirmed the same priorities and we uh, did away with the tier one, tier two, because it was kind of a <clears throat> not a very um, important uh, distinction between tier one and tier two. So we um, didn't have a order of priority except that these five, six items were all goals that we're working toward. And I think um, as a reevaluation for last year, we achieved most of our goals. And I said that. I think we received probably 90%. Uh, and only 10%, which I wanted to see more, was the diversity and uh, cultural events, and we're having that. We're going to have uh, like a foodie event and festivals coming up. So I'm, I'm happy that we're going to be able to develop that priority a little better this year. <coughs> so those couple things that I'm going to just to reiterate what um, uh, Pro Tem Cindy Tran said. Uh, let's see if I can remember anything else. No, that's it. Steph. Thank you. Uh, yeah, over the weekend, uh, we had all the baseball parades, both in West Garden Grove and Pony Baseball, <clears throat> and then the State of the District for GGUSD last night. I really thought how it speaks to our city motto of youth and ambition. The future is definitely bright here in Garden Grove. Um, I also want to make mention of the event on Thursday, partnering with the Garden Grove Chamber, Downtown Business Association, and Garden Grove Neighborhood Association. If you have a trespass letter on file as a small business, you need now, per legislation, to have it notarized. So the event on Thursday will be held at Coastline starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, if you're a small business owner or manager, please come and have your trespassing letters notarized, and then they'll be taken to the police station from there. So it'll be a one-stop shop. Uh, there's information on the Chamber's Facebook page as well as my uh, council Facebook page, and we hope to see you there. Thank you. Can I ask Stephanie a question? Um, yes. The clarification on that event, mm -hmm. um, what will the business owner, who will the representative need to be, and what will they need to have for the notary? <laughs> like, I'm the president of a nonprofit, and we have a building, or... Yes, it, you can be who, you can business owner manager of the business. Um, this has to have the trespass letter, and then the notary will be there. She's offering her normal fee is fifteen. She's offering the notary stamp for twelve dollars and the signature, and then we'll be able to take that paperwork with us. We'll also have QR codes, so if people don't have a letter and want to go through that entire process for the first time at the event, we'll be able to do that as well. So as long as it's a designated re representative of that business or company, correct. Preferably yes. the owner or who, the landowner or the principal of the business. Yeah, exactly. And the chamber's been really great about helping sort okay. of with that education process. I just process wanted everybody to be prepared with what they need or who's Absolutely. the right person to be there. Definitely. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, Cindy. Yeah. So what time clock is it? Uh, eight in the morning. Yeah, we're going to try to do eight. To, we have it till eight to noon, uh, anytime within that, just because I figure people probably need to get back to work and, and so forth. So we're going to try to have it in the morning and I'm going to bring donuts. So thank I'm you. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's very important because I, I've had a lot of businesses because I represent Absolutely. a lot of the, the plaza, you know, the um, and um, there's a lot of businesses that have problems during, and then, and then they, the police department can't do anything if the business hasn't told them to enforce a trespassing issue. So this is a great event. Great. I think this is just kind of kicking yeah. it off. I mean, I know there'll be more opportunities in the future. The chambers on top of it. So thank you. Uh, yes, a couple of comments. Um, city Manager, I just want to highlight for your attention, Public Works and for SRT, uh, Motel 6 is, again, <laughs> Caltrans property area, although it was cleaned, is now uh, slowly growing into an encampment. Um, also, wanted to share some information with the public in case they so feel generous enough to help contribute. A District 5 resident, a tiny little Luna buoy, is uh, fighting liver cancer. Um, she is very outgoing. She loves making TikTok dances. She's very caring. Um, and she's currently going to have surgery in April and then go through chemo. I did share the GoFundMe page on our neighborhood pages, so if you come across it, please share it and contribute. We all know that healthcare costs are extremely expensive, and I know, believe John Bowie, who is the father and um, what former classmate of mine at Santiago High School, I believe, has left his job to care for his daughter, and so I know the family needs that help. Um, so anything you can do to spread the word and... Uh, help that family would be very much appreciated. 
Um, also want to highlight that we are a week away from elections and I feel like nobody knows an election is happening. Um, I know one of my biggest frustrations and that of folks that I talk to almost every day is that um, because of the changes with the ROV, voting centers change every election and no one knows where they're supposed to go vote. Um, so I hope that the city is providing that information to our residents um, and in the future working with the ROV to ensure that we pick locations um, where we'll engage every district because there's multiple in certain districts and then one in one district and two in others. And so I think that's not that's not equitable. I know that that decision is usually based on high propensity, um, but that's why there's high propensity because there's more opportunities for people to vote in those areas. So we need to make sure that those are equitable and we're spreading that love everywhere. Um, just because there's a ballot box, one per district, doesn't mean that there should only be one voting center. And I think we need to really uh, call the attention to the ROV for that uh, so that we can increase voter um, participation in all districts. And lastly, I had something and I forgot, so I'll end it with that one. Thank okay. you. City Manager Lisa Kim. Uh, Honorable Mayor, Mayor and members of the council, I, I do have one highlight I want to share and, and I'm, I'm going to be taking our finance director, Patricia Song's thunder. So she wants mm. to share that the city has received its first ever Distinguished Budget Presentation Award from the Government mm. Finance Officer Association or GFOA for our fiscal year 24-25 biannual budget. And GFOA recognizes budget documents um, of the very highest quality that reflects both guidelines established by the National Advisory Council on state and local budgeting and the GFOA's best practices on budgeting. And so among the 109,000 cities among the nations, um, approximately 1,800 cities are recognized and Garden Grove is one. So congratulations to Patricia and her finance team for this accomplishment. Wonderful. General Counsel, any need for a closed session or anything to report out? No, Mayor, nothing from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. With that, we will stand adjourned. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. <laughs>